Hi, everybody. Welcome to another Share the Mic Monday. Um, my name is Jean Marie Kevens. I am the owner and head imaginator at Little Shadow Productions. And I am very pleased to be co presenting this evening with Eileen Smith at Springworks Festival in Canada. Um, we have put together this evening to talk a little bit about dance movement, the importance of it, why it matters, um, and things that, that Eileen and I have been talking about since pre-COVID and during COVID. Um, so once COVID began, uh, we found ourselves kind of stuck, not moving, not excited about moving, wanting to get outside of our houses and in a bit of a rut and looking for community. And so we got together and put together these Wellness Wednesday um, dance movement uh, 27 minute bite sized piece classes to help alleviate some of that uh, energy and give people the tools they need to feel good. Um, and the ladies who we are joined with tonight are all people who uh, have been instructing those classes. They are wonderful, wonderful uh, dance and movement teachers and we're really excited to have them here. Um, so we'll just go around the space and quickly introduce ourselves and then get into conversation. Um, so I'll just, for ease of Zoom, I will uh, go ahead and call out your names. Um, I'm Jean Marie Kevens. I'm based in Brooklyn, New York. Alexis. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Alexis Milligan, and I am based in Dartmouth, Nova Scotia, which is on the east coast of Canada. Awesome. And would you mind just telling us a little bit about your, your I should have said this, your, um, your yeah. practice, what it is that you're involved in, in terms of dance and movement to give us all a little bit more? Oh, for sure. Um, so I have been involved in dance since I was a small child, but it's been sort of evolving uh, throughout my career to include uh, puppetry, physical theater. Um, so the, the dance aspect sort of kept transforming and now it's even going further than that where a lot of it the work that I'm doing now is actually related in communications and how what how our body movement is how we communicate on all of these levels um, obviously not just sort of in a non-verbal capacity because sometimes it, there are sounds that are associated with our gestures as we work through our bodies but how movement and and how we physically impact each other uh, so that we do have an impact physically on how we relate to people and uh, how we interact with everybody. So that's kind of like my passion right now is I'm I sort of focus on communications and doing my master's in interdisciplinary studies right now at the University of New Brunswick, which is combining performing arts, communications and uh, neuroscience. So that's kind of where my world is right now. And then I just work at the Shaw. I'm a movement director and a movement coach at the Shaw Festival. And I feel very blessed to work with an incredibly talented company. That's it. Awesome. Thank you. Welcome. Um, Allison. Hi, everyone. My name is Allison Plamondon. I am Zooming in from Toronto today. And I'm a New York-based choreographer, actor, teacher, et cetera, hyphen, hyphen, um, that <laughs> I, I'm, uh, I don't know what else to say. I, I love movement and that's why I'm here. I can't wait to talk more about it. Awesome. Thank you. Eileen. Hi, I'm Eileen Smith and I'm based in Stratford, Ontario. And I personally am a singer, but I've been an actor mover type person and I um, connected to the a lot of these lovely ladies at the Shaw Festival where amidst the COVIDness we started looking at wellness as a concept and so and I met Jean Marie in the puppet world and so many of my worlds are intersecting here. Beautiful thank you Gabby. Hello everyone my name is Gabriella Sundar Singh. I am also zooming in from Toronto today and when I am dancing and when I am moving, I am the happiest I've ever been. Um, it makes me feel free. It makes me feel good. It helps me express myself. And I think it can do a lot of those things for other people too. So I'm really thankful for um, these spaces where we get to talk about that. And also 
uh, the wonders of working online these days and being able to share movement and dance um, across these stretches of spaces. It's, it's kind of wild, but wonderful. So yeah, thank you. Thank you, Sika. Hi, I'm Abbasika Phillips and I'm zooming in from Queens, New York. And I have been a group X instructor for about six years. Um, I teach dance fitness. I teach Zumba um, specifically. Um, and Zumba is, it's a cultural um, Spanish culture type of dance. And what I've done is I've taken a little spin on it and I've um, infused it with my culture, which is um, African and Caribbean. And so I use a lot of um, different types of music, music, world music from all over the world um, in my classes. And I think it's great to just introduce our communities to different cultures and teach them movement from different cultures. And um, I volunteer for Shape Up NYC, which is just um, <clears throat> it's a community-based organization. And um, we partner, instructors partner with New York City and they put us in parks or spaces and we teach these, our classes, you know, for free, just, you know, community outreach for people to come and move. And a lot of the people that do attend the classes are elderly people and sometimes they're not, you know, our, um, their outreach is pretty big because it's, they partner with neighborhoods, they partner with people. So a lot of times, you know, um, people will come to class just because they heard about the class, you know, and they, they heard it was good and it's a good time and it's a party. So they want to come and check it out. So um, it's been really good. I have pretty big classes. I was doing teaching in Harlem and I also was teaching in, um, in gyms in, in Queens pre-COVID. So right now I'm not in any gym. So, you know, we love to dance. We love to have fun. We love to have a good time. And I know Jean Marie from um, the fashion industry, because <laughs> I'm originally a fashion designer, but I love dancing. So um, that's how I got into this, my little, my side hustle. Yeah, I feel a little outed. I should have seen that coming. Like prior to puppetry in the theater world and entertainment, I used to work in fashion and, um, and I miss it and I love it. But the people that I connected with there were people who, who saw fashion as storytelling and saw it as a place to, as a vehicle for um, not just for self-expression, but for bringing people together. And you, you see who your community is from time to time, just based on what they're wearing, right? You can tell that somebody's a like-minded person because they're giving you the signals. Um, and uh, Sika and I have had many conversations over that and uh, we both like to wear heels. So, you know, <laughs> fact. Um, <laughs> And uh, Alexis, I was really excited to just hear you say the word puppet. I didn't know that. That's so exciting. Somehow puppetry always comes back into these conversations. Um, but Sika, I would love to uh, jump off of something that you were just saying, which was talking about uh, community and how puppetry, excuse me, how dance um, brings together community. And I wonder if anybody else wants to um, expand on that or explore um, any of the experiences they've been having recently in terms of how dance and community is happening in this moment in time. One of the other panelists said it right when she said that, you know, the way how we're interacting, which is, you know, getting people from all over the world just to be able to um, show their classes on you know, virtually on the internet, on Zoom, on whatever platform you're on. I think that that's amazing because since I've been home, I've taken classes from people in Spain, you know, from different different places. And I don't think that um we were able to do that before because so many people are shy to go online. I myself am one of the shy people. I mean, I have other reasons why I didn't take my classes online because I just enjoy the interaction, you know, Taking, of taking a live class. So I really enjoy the live classes, but I have also been, you know, a student and taken classes from other people that I enjoy, that I love that are not in New York and are not in the United States. And 
I think that's how this moment transcends for us who is in dance and in these, you know, in these different um, fitness roles or theater or whatever, we still have a medium that we can use to connect. So I think that, you know, it's, it's so important to be able to do that no matter where you are, at home, outside, in, you know, wherever you are, we, we're still able to connect. And that's the, that's the magic of this time, of this COVID um, period or era, whatever it would be called later on. That's the magic. <laughs> we'll, <laughs> find out. We'll, we'll find out what this gets named, right? And call it. <laughs> Anybody else want to speak to that? Yeah, I'll just hop in. I I, I totally agree with you, Abosika. I think it's about the about the connection. I was ta I was having a conversation with someone the other day. Maybe we we're talking more about the more about theater or more just about relationships. And re regardless, I, for myself, whether I'm doing the work in a studio with young people or I'm being zoomed into like a high school class to do a a workshop, it still takes effort, right? It's the effort on my part to want to be there and want to share. And there's effort on part of the, the teacher or whoever's coordinating and those kids to be present and want to participate. So as long as the effort's there and the will to want to communicate and be together is there, I'm really, I'm really thankful for it being available, whatever, whatever space it's in. Also, I've run out of energy to, to fight whatever uh whatever that feeling was early or on the pandemic which is i don't want to go online i don't know how it's going to feel i, I don't want to feel like i'm in this box inside this box whatever that feeling was which was paired with a lot of other emotions mm -hmm. months ago i've stopped fighting it and i've tried to embrace whatever this medium in is and embracing it has uh, completely changed my my mindset does that if I, yeah <laughs> absolutely Wonderful. Anyone else? Um, one of the things that I've, uh, that I found is being able to, in this medium, uh, teaching over Zoom and reconnecting and finding even new communities of people in this time, um, is the idea that we're in our, in our little squares. <laughs> We are actually moving in time, in space together in our, in our, in our rooms, but yet somehow we are, we are actually moving together in time, in space, in different time zones. In, and so there's a, uh, an exercise I do, I, I run a class and we just do uh, like a sun salutation, you know, we just, but it's the whole goal is to do choral movement. So the whole thing is just about let's move together. and. I had no idea that if it was going to be successful, <laughs> they went on to Zoom and I thought, oh, this is like, what is this going to even be? And it's amazing to me that as because we do sort of five rounds of it, every time we are all coming up at the same moment and we're all going forward. And it's and it's just like philosophical, like to expand my idea of what moving in space means, what moving in time is that I've always, you know, it's like you're in the room and you're moving together and you're, you know, going across the floor together or you're moving to this music together. And it's your high yet, but yet here we are with people on mute or their videos off even. And I just, we're just somehow we're all just moving together still. And I think that's it because it's like, uh, we, we have this, we have this to hold on to. We are moving in time and space together in our own little, like, squares and rooms and it's that's just magical I just I, I was, I was, I've been blown away by that even still like now I'm still blown away by that I I definitely cheer for what everyone has said I agree I had the same kind of fight slash reluctance at the beginning um t taking class teaching class but then for me, especially I was in the, you know, at the, in the Bronx in the be beginning of the pandemic. So the, the charge of the neighborhood was such that I needed to move like for, for myself. So that, that urgency was more, uh, needed to be dealt with, Never mind my pride and my expectation of how it's going to look, how it's going to go. 
Um, and shortly thereafter, I took a, an, an Alexander class with a wonderful teacher, and she reminded us that we're not actually connecting this way, we're connecting this way. And, and that just like completely blew my, blew my mind about it. And I was like, of, of course, we are moving together in that sense. So that gave me a sense of community that I only hope I can bring back when we're in the room together. I don't wanna take that for granted. So, thanks. If I can add, I think what I've found is um, important right now is having the infrastructure, right? Is having uh, whether whether it's with uh, like Little Shadow Productions or or like having the in infrastructure in place uh, to be able to provide uh, that that kind of outreach. I uh, I've spent the last I don't know how many years now seven maybe seven plus working with the city of Toronto and that's primarily where I teach dance classes, um, Bollywood and sometimes Bharatanatyam, which is my other my classical form and I and other things. Um, but then the neighborhood I teach in um, is a, it's an underserved community. Uh, a lot of those kids don't have access to the arts. So coming into the community center and being able to be together for even like that, that one hour, that, that it's such a huge outlet for them. And something that was really frustrating this past year was uh, for, for whatever reason, uh, we weren't able to get on online quickly. Programs were just like slashed and cut and put on hold. We're moving into this uh, spring summer session to, to uh, try and, provide online uh, like virtual programming but I just keep thinking about all those again because I, I work primarily with young people all those young people who've been <laughs> without for 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 so long and granted even if the programs are available a lot of them may not have access in their in their own homes to be able to even access this so it's uh that we we have and we also have have not but you know it's that it's that balance I mean, do you want to pick up there? Because I know that that has been an initiative that you've been uh, attempting to address during this time. It is really an interesting challenge to get into the school systems and or other support systems. And, and we've been trying to figure out how to do that and the degrees to which they are struggling. And also the issue of funding always is always a question of how do we actually support artists and how do we provide something and, and to address the fact that kids are being required to stay in a three foot square for the complete day and various, um, all of the programming is shifted over where you're in a single room for you know however many minutes the complete day and you're allowed out of the building. We're still working on trying to make that a possibility and accessing but the teachers are so overwhelmed. So there's so much overwhelm in this. It's a challenging to try and find solutions. And each of us are sort of trying to move forward in that. For myself, the permission of, of the screen as a grown up in a situation, the Zoom gives you a different set of permissions, which I found very useful for my demographic versus those struggling in the school systems. So. It's interesting that makes me think of um, there's a, a puppeteer colleague of mine who has a lot of access and resources but works with people who don't but he lives out in the woods and he teaches um, I don't know the correct terminology but it is a martial arts of sorts whichever one it is that he teaches um, and he lives on a hill and he basically called up every single parent in the school that he teaches at, and he only teaches one or two classes. And he said, if you can get your kids to my driveway, I'll teach. And so they put sticks up the driveway so that the kids know where they can stop. And he stands at the bottom and they move, you know? And he said, I don't expect them all to be at the same level. My goal is not to get a belt on them. My goal is to get them back mentally to where they were and to get me mentally where I was. Because otherwise, when we are back together in the same space, I have to catch up too. And I thought there was such a um, oddly progressive thought in that, you know, like we forget that unless we're exercising our muscles as artists, as instructors, as community organizers, if we're not exercising that, then we're, we're barely able to pull everybody along when we're back in whatever normal will look like, you know? So it's interesting to think about like, how do we find a way to get to people who uh, 
can't afford this box that we're all in. It's interesting. Um, I would love to kind of segue, if you don't mind, to uh, something that a couple of you have touched on, and I'm going to use Gabriella's class as an example. Um, the first class that we offered in this session or group of sessions um, was Onika Phillips was teaching soca dance, and uh, she did a 55 minute like super intense class where we all like got down in our boxes because we didn't want her to see how badly we were failing but it was awesome when it was over so many people were like i need more of that i want more of that and gabriella when you taught i got so high on the movement that i confess that i have banked that class and i might have done it once or twice since so um, because I just love the pop to it. Like there's something about the pop that uh, feels like a, a release. And also for me, a command that I miss. I miss having to make my mark. I didn't know that I would ever miss that. Like I miss having to, to find my light. I miss having like the certain structures um, of, of creating art and dance and movement and puppetry. I forgot that that was a thing that um, that having that structure around was so important. And it occurred to me in the missing it that there's something that cultural storytelling brings that commands certain, I don't know what it is. Like, is it a kinetic thing? I don't know. But um, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about, you know, bringing your cultural storytelling through dance, um, you know, how you see people respond to that. I just know how I respond. So I'm curious what your thoughts are. Yeah, I will. Um, what I can offer is I, I've been doing Bharatanatyam, again, classical Indian dance from the south of India for, for over 25 years. My mom was a dancer before me. So she put me into dance so I could have a connection to my culture and my heritage, but also to her, <laughs> maybe selfishly for her. But, but I'm so thankful that, that she did that. Um, and uh, the amazing thing about the, t the style of dance that I do is that it is defined as drama dance. It's not like it's that's in its definition. It is storytelling and it is dance. So it's always, always, always more than your hands are here. Your hands are here. Your hands are. It's not like there's there's a meaning. <laughs> there's a meaning behind everything there's and and every move helps create the story that you're trying to tell so i think maybe that's part of what we get to tap into when i when i teach either Bharatanatya classes or i teach bollywood classes but like i'll infuse it with classical moves because again selfishly like i want to use <laughs> i want to use what i have and i want to share it but i i think that's maybe what it is is that i'm tapping into more than uh feet it like i i just i want your feet in parallel or i want like you saying you're like really nice and and tall because we, we can do that too and we can take those commands and we can and we can work within within those those frames but then we can go beyond and we can tell story and we can connect to heritage and we can connect to culture and connect to each other and i try to do that in my classes i try to give a little bit of a framework and even if it's something as simple as in this move you're going to see because a, a lot of the stories do come back to this you're going to see your lover like literally across the pond and your eyes are going to go and find them and then your body's going to follow it, right? So if we put a bit of a structure in a story, it goes, I think it goes deeper. And then I think that's the fun thing to tap into. And, but that exists, that exists in, I think all, all of our, all of our forms of storytelling and dance. We just gotta, sometimes we just gotta say it. Maybe that's what it is. We just have to say it out loud. <laughs> yeah. Anybody else want to touch on their storytelling or cultural significance to what it is that they are they're doing or offering? I think not. I think one of the things that um, always is comes back over and over and over again whenever I'm I'm teaching or I'm I'm moving or thinking about you know just songs as they they you know come on the radio and the way you move your body is movement is a part of our first literacies as human beings right from the get-go we our artistic practices they are communication they were the very form first forms of communication they are our first literacies 
So movement is our first literacy and we, we were able to translate our life experiences and celebrate um, mark, like mark times in the year and, and harvests and, you know, uh, huntings and rites of passage and aging. And, you know, we had this ability to have these ceremonies, these traditions, and they were rooted in song, they were rooted in dance, they were rooted in rhythm, they were rooted in, in markings on the on cave walls, we drew our stories. So when we talk about the very basics of, of our ability to feel story, even if we can't put our finger on it, what moves us and why we come back to movement is a part of that, that need to express, to communicate. And, and when we get to that place where we don't have the words and we are filled with feeling, if you just put on that song and you just move your body, something will change. Something will change inside you. It, and, it, you know, then there's all the neurological stuff and there's all this, you know, the circulatory system, so there's all the other things that happen. But, but just that it's, this is our, these are our languages and, and they are unifying. They do bring us together. We do, again, we come together in these ways because we, this is how we have evolved. We've evolved in our different areas and our different groups and our different places. But, but the, the structures of it is that traditional dance is, is rooted in the very makings of all of our cultures and song and story and um, exchange, you know, and, and whether that's faith-based or culture, like different cultural expressions, right? This is, this is just part of how we actually really, this is about how we come together. I think that is what's so instinctual about movement is it is it is nonverbal, but yet so much is is taking place, and it really does bring us together. I think that's what I have to say about that. I would just like to add that um, the music, you know, is a big part of the of the story, right? You know, whatever music that you select, the feeling that it evokes in you, you know. I, I personally like to bring a, a curated list of music to my class because it's expanding their music knowledge and it's giving them different feelings, you know, that, that may be something that they might not even connect with. I know I watch Bollywood movies and Bollywood is so much about the love story and falling in love and just, you know, the interaction between the couple and it's a musical, you know, so you get caught up in the story of it and, and get caught up in the feeling and just the fantasy. Um, but I think all music, all cultures, you know, bring that. And to be able to bring that to your students, to show them something different. And even a lot of the music I select, it's not, it's, it's not English, you know? So a lot of times they don't even understand what's being said and they don't, they're not familiar, but it's so universal that they don't even have to understand, you know, they just, they get it. They get the movement, they get the feeling, they get that it's joyous, they get that, you know, we're here together and it's a community and we're all enjoying the music, enjoying the drums, enjoying the beat or the rhythm. And it's, it's a language in itself. So I think music really is, is the, the link for, for the movement and, and um, for people to communicate and for people to connect. I have a, I have a question I wanna to pose to the room, is that okay? This is jumping off of what you said earlier, Allison, about like the need to move um, because of whatever, whatever is going on in our lives, whatever is going on you know, socially and globally or whatever is affecting us the deepest. Um, I, I can say for myself that, uh, summer felt very pressurized and I felt very caught in my body, like really like bound in my body and fall hit. And we finally put away the patio furniture and our backyard was empty. And I never, I love dancing outside, but I'd never done it here in my home because I don't, I, I shy about neighbors whatever that is. And this was, but this something, something cracked in me this fall, something just snapped. I put on my headphones, I went outside, I said, I'm sorry, mom and dad, 
tell the neighbors, you know, whatever you need to tell them, but I'm going outside and I'm just going to dance until I, until I can't dance anymore. And there was something beautiful about being out in space, but I'm, what I'm sorry, what I'm trying to get to is, uh, my relationship, my personal relationship with movement has completely changed. Like what I use it for or what it does for me. And I just, I just heard a little bit of that in what you said, Allison. So I'm, if you want to talk more about that, or if anybody else wants to talk about their personal relationship with movement and dance right now. I guess for me, just to expand on it, definitely the need, uh, the need for me has always been there to express myself through dance. Um, and now that I've gone and kind of found my modes of expression also in other ways and coming back to dance, I really obviously believe that it's all connected. So even if I'm going to sit down and write, I still need to move my body before I, I do it. Uh, but that was a hard earned lesson. You know, I really tried to put them in little Zoom boxes like, oh, no get your mind working oh no your body can do that so so i've wised up in that way um and also gabby it's kind of what you were talking before about moving with intention like there's something about the movement for me that if it's done with intention and and mindfulness um and I'm actually asking myself what I need, that it's really therapeutic. And that can range whether I'm tap dancing or whether I'm doing something a little more abstract, but that's uh, in my movement journey, especially in during this pandemic, um, it's it's learning to, to ask what I need. And it is always movement, but what is it? It's not, it's not in a prescribed, manner that is at the same time every day and doing the same thing so i'm st i'm still learning of course but i'm i'm in that way i'm i'm very grateful for this time for this discovery for these, these discoveries i was wondering if you guys have any intuitions on all well, alexis add to that but once that um why we impede ourselves from doing things that we know that would make us feel better what is what are is, does anybody have a sense of what that's about i think that it's i think that a lot of the things that we don't do is out of fear fear of judgment fear of what people might think even though we're you know and it's so funny because we're already out in front of people so it's weird to think that you can get up in front of an audience and you know be an actor and actress and in some of you guys feel or puppets and or even get in front of a classroom and teach and then when it comes to just this medium you know you're there's a level of shyness and um, a level of judgment that people are worried about. Um, I know because I, that's part of what I went through with getting on. But like um, Gabby said, something just it, something has to crack in you. You have to really just let go of the fear and let go of the um, whatever insecurities we have, how we look, how we appear to people, or whatever perception, public perception, and just go for it and just do what you love because at the end of the day, that's what it's about. It's about enjoying it and finding enjoyment in it and not worrying about, you know, what people are thinking, what people think of you. Like they say, like, you know, dance like no one's watching. So you have to be able to do it, whatever it is that you love, like no one's watching because that's when you get the, that's when you get to the, the pureness of it. The, that's the purity of it. It's interesting, Alexis, but am I cutting you off? Okay. Um, all of you in some way, shape or form talked about, um, this communication that happens and how there's this innate need and reflection that happens when we are, when we're moving our bodies. And, um, I've always been, um, very shy about my form. And I think part of that is just being a woman 
um, who is being seen and being objectified and all the things that go with that. And then asking to use this thing that's objectified to express myself. That is certainly a, a challenge for me. And so puppetry was like an, a, uh, it was brought to me later in life. It was not something that I, as a child thought like, oh, I'll do this. That wasn't my story. But when I found it, I thought, oh, this is great because I can take this object and you'll look over here and I can use that to communicate. I can use that to move. I can transfer all of this energy over here, but I still feel it in my breath. I still feel it in my, my soul. You know, there's the storytelling is still happening. It's just transferred and you're paying attention to this. And there's been a universality that I have been able to experience traveling around the world where we don't have the same language, but I can move this object and suddenly we're all uh, speaking the same truth and exploring the same ideas. And so it's interesting to me to always to be around dancers because there's a, um, whether the confidence is real or not, there is a knowing of their physicality that they are confident enough to share their story directly in their being. And I really like, I bow down to that. Um, but in this exploration of these workshops, Eileen and I keep coming back to like, why wouldn't you move your body when you know that it reduces the onset of Alzheimer's? Why wouldn't you move your body when you know all of the health and mental benefits of it? Like, what is that thing? And I, I for me, I have learned over this time that that truth of the 13 year old and the 15 year old and the person who always wanted to dance is, I don't want you to look at me. Like, that's really my reason. And that's not everybody's reason, but I know that that's my reason. And in this time of COVID, the comfort of the box has actually like helped break me out of that. And each of you have done that, which I am so grateful for. Um, but what I'm hoping is that there's some kind of um, larger community benefit that's happening from that, right? Like I can't possibly be the only one who's having that. And um, I see here that Carol Sterling has asked a question. Carol Sterling is by the way, the queen of asking really good questions. Um, how do the benefits of movement transfer to other aspects of your life? And I wonder if each of you could speak to that. It's a good moment to think for a second. Um, because I feel like uh, I also pick up on <clears throat> just what you were saying there before we go into that question is just to, just to identify the safety net of the video on versus video off. Um, and that I have a lot of people that I'm teaching. Um, I actually teach a, a number of seniors and um, that's been a community experience in that they, I realized um, that there was a large group of older individuals who could not, who have not been able to leave and who usually would be going to classes, multiple classes at their local YMCA or at the library or, you know, and suddenly don't, like it's all stopped. Um, so find a community through that group, just the, the routine of coming every week, plus the safety net that they don't have to turn their videos on that they are in the comfort of their own home, that their video is off, they feel safe. And I am curious to know if when we go back to the studio, <laughs> if there's going to be, a, I mean, a significant adjustment. I know that if we're talking about a traditional dance class, you know, we've grown up with those mirrors right in front of us. Those are not the, the nicest things to have shining back at it, you know, <laughs> all of the, all of our flaws that we, we only see are, you know, screaming at us uh, with our every movement. But, but I wonder about actually the continuation of online classes, because you have the ability to just be in your own space doing your thing without worrying about what other people are thinking. I am in a completely safe space working the way that I am able to work with modifications I have to make or I just need to like stop and not do that exercise and not feel like I've let the class down or I'm a failure or all that extra negative noise that's rattling around. Um, so in, the, in that sense, um, coming to this question that's like looped around, um, 
the benefits of movement pre-COVID and during COVID, I think, have have changed. Like, moving now is my savior. <laughs> like, I just took it all for granted. I mean, I try not to take a lot of things for granted, but that was something that just, the everyday movement that we have in our lives, like I was talking to some students today and it was just the fact that you're in your classroom, you'd get up, you'd walk down the hall to go to the bathroom or you might go down to the principal's office or a supply closet to get something or you're up for lunch or you're doing this or you're doing that. Just everyday physical movement. If I'm in a Zoom meeting and a Zoom meeting and a Zoom meeting and a thing and a thing and a thing, and a thing it could be five hours, like it, the length of a long play ride <laughs> that I haven't gotten up out of my chair for any long period of time. And so movement in its health capacity is so much more, I'm so much more aware of that now um, than I was pre-COVID. Um, so that movement not just being a class like that is one thing heart rates going up and all those other things that but just every day getting up and moving through space doing like going up the stairs going out to the garden going for a walk you know so I think my relationship with movement in how it transfers to my life is different now it's just completely different I would, the way I would say movement, the benefits transfer into other aspects. Well, for me, I'm, I'm a mom. So I had my last daughter when I was 37, my three-year-old. And what I realized is that, and I do a lot of cardio. So I realized that just picking her up, just, just doing this motion was hard on my back and it's not something I noticed before. So um, what I started to incorporate into my workouts was more yoga, more stretching, because I wasn't doing those stretching. And I think um, movement is necessary for just everyday activities. It's, you know, we sit down a lot. And even with this pause during COVID, we've been doing a lot of sitting. We've been doing a lot of eating. We've been doing a lot of TV watching. And I think that you know, and I had a moment too, where I like snapped out of it and was like, oh my God, you know, like I'm not working out. The gyms are closed. This is, you know, everything's shut down. Like, so pre-COVID I was way more active, but I think after COVID, I realized that I had to be more intentional with the workouts that I did. So I did more cardio then, but then now I do more um, stretching. I do more um, weight training because I need the strength and I need, you know, I need to stretch my body because I notice as I'm getting older that, um, you know, certain things don't, don't, don't move the same, you know, and that's something that I've noticed. So movement is just, for me, it's imperative. And I think, I'm not sure if it's because I've always been active and I know like, um, some people get into movement later on in life. Some people don't like to work out. For me, my story is my mom, I had the kind of parent that would get on QVC and buy all those like workout stuff and she'd never use them. So from when I was like, probably, I don't know, so young, I would just be the, I was the guinea pig for all the, the ab roller and this and that. <laughs> so I've been working out for a really long time. And I realized that when I don't move, I don't feel the same. Like my body is just not happy at all. So it's, it, I think it, it helps us, movement is necessary for us to be able to maintain our health, it's maintain our weight, maintain our peace of mind, our moods. It does so much that you don't realize it does until you actually stop doing it. If it's something that you're used to doing and if it's something that you're not used to doing, when people do start it, they realize, oh, wow, my mood's better. I feel better. My body, you know, I might be 
in pain from the workout, but it's instead of it being a back pain, it's a good pain. It's a pain that my muscles are working. It's a pain that, you know, that says your body needed to do this instead of, you know, you just hurting because you sat down all day, you know, for, and, and you have back pain because of something that you, that's a normal movement and it, it's not functioning like it should be because you're not used to doing that movement. So it's, it's movement is important for our health overall and our, our peace of mind, our well being, you know, and, um, and our moods. And I think that that's something that's really important as far as what we've gone through with COVID because it's been hard on everyone. And I think the more people did get up and move, the more you did get out there and do more with your body and just intentionally got up and said, you know what, let me do something, you felt better, you know, and it was better for your health. So the, the benefits are, they're amazing. Is so many things we can keep going. <laughs> I'm gonna let somebody else. <laughs> Definitely peace of mind for me, that's everything. And also I have to admit, I have to admit, like I'm the only one who's addicted to my phone. Even like, you know, I have three devices in this square feet, in this little room. And so it is a miracle to me to take class, do class, do something for an hour and not look at my phone or a device. I know you're usually doing class on a device, but not necessarily. So, so that I take into the rest of my day. I take into everything else and, and really try okay so then you can do this you can do this class without looking at your phone you can <laughs> there, there's no stopping me <laughs> that's what i feel something that just hit me is as you, you're both speaking i've been thinking about um this our current circumstances of, of taking and teaching classes online or engaging with dance and movement Yes, over Zoom and through these various boxes. I've been thinking about it in terms of something I had before and I'm transferring it here, um, but something that's really beautiful and I would love to like hear from somebody or know the statistic is uh, people who didn't have, and you already you were speaking to this a bit, uh, Ablasika, but people who didn't have movement perhaps in their life people who didn't dance, people who didn't feel comfortable just getting up and being and extending or whatever that is, and maybe have, and Alexis, you were, you were talking to this too, have found it now in, in over these past couple months in this past year, like that is so, that's so beautiful and profound and like what an amazing discover, like what an amazing discovery. I mean, I, I'm trying to think if I know anybody personally, but they, they're out there, right? They have to be out there. I, I, I think it's happened. Maybe there's this whole new movement movement of movement happening. That's exciting, right? I just want to interject. It is exciting. And I think that what um, she was saying about there's a whole, there's a whole new people that are like Jean Marie said that are taking it or moving for the first time and they don't have to be seen. So I think that um, not only will classes resume like we're used to having them, but I think that the online isn't going to go away because there are people that want to do it and don't want to be seen and don't want to be, you know, judged and they don't want people looking at them. And I think these are the people that are still probably going to take the, the Zoom classes and take the online stuff because they're in the comfort of their own home. So I think that I think that it's changed us, but it's changed us for the better. It's 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 expanded our our reach and expanded the the um the people that's gonna attend, you know. And the teachers too, like the 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 um, the ability to take a class with someone in another country, like or that you're you know someone that you love is teaching or there's like this amazing workshop or something happening and then you get to like you know 
go to class. You still get to go, you can do your class or that you are away, but your favorite class is happening or, you know, like, I don't want to miss, you know, I don't want to miss you get like, I don't want to miss your Zumba class. And I love your Zumba class, but I got to go away for work. It's like, you've just set up the camera and it's like, you're just doing it on zoom. And then you're in your hotel room or you're in wherever you need to be. And it's happening, you know, like I think, I think that's, that's been in a, a real, um, again, like it, it's from meetings, like these, all these actual really amazing things that have been happening as a result. Um, and I think that just being able to find your way into something like this, you on your, like for yourself, the way you connect to it with like for you, I think there's something in that that's happening as well. Like, I think that people are coming to it because it, it's like, it's, they are letting that part of themselves out to, to shine, to ask the question to that sort of thing. Do you guys have any suggestions for the worker bees of the world that seem unable to find the time for themselves to do a thing that they absolutely adore doing, but they, and they know that that would make them feel better and it gives them joy. And for some reason, there's a component of COVIDness where there's a huge conglomerate of humans that are working harder than they've ever worked. And how the fantasy, the dream, the hope that COVID would get people to have a better balance of, you know, some versions of caring for each other and self and work-life balance and stuff, I find is a thing that is a uh, challenge. So, well, regarding the work-life balance, it's it's important because right now I'm doing two different things. I'm doing two different jobs and I'm not teaching as I would want to. Um, so I have to just intentionally set my alarm for 5 a.m. just to get up and work out. And I know <laughs> it's, uh, 5 a.m. sounds horrendous, <laughs> but you know what? I feel that my day goes better when I get up and I do that for myself. And, you know, I spend my, my hours devoting it to a job and doing something for somebody else, but that's just, we have to intentionally set the time for, to do that for ourselves, for our body, for our health, our well-being, our mental and emotional well-being. It's so much that's tied into that little half an hour that you give yourself. It's so worth it just to say, let me take this time and, and do this and let me just, you know, stop <laughs> and and do that for myself, do that for my health. And I noticed that um, when I do it, you know, it reflects on my kids, like my little three-year-old, she's interested in it. She's got a yoga mat. It's not just for me. It's like, you know, everybody that's around you sees you taking that time for yourself and, and um, they also want to give that to themselves too. It's, so it's infectious. It's, it's something that you know, you'll feel so much better doing when you do, when you do give yourself that time. It's always that hurdle. It's that little bit, it's the, it's that first step. And that is the biggest step. That's the hardest step to take, which is, I'm going to do it. And as soon as we take that step, then it will take you on the all the other steps. Like it'll sweep you up and take you. But it's always that that first one. And I think that comes down to permissions. And I think that's about taking and giving yourself the that that control that you have it, that you're not being swept and carried along by all the other things in your life but that you get to put something down and say, I give myself permission to take the, to, and to know that it's, it's effortful. And sometimes we think about like those workouts or those classes or those things. And it's like, Oh, I'm just so tired. Like I can't even, and that is just the, it is the craziest thing that by the end of it, 
you're going to feel like a, you're going to be 180 degrees in where you were, but you can't see that. <clears throat> you can't see that bef like in before you take that step. So that big, that's a big step. But, and I, there's, I don't think there's a, there's an answer. I don't think there's a solution because I think it's hard. It is a hard step to take. That first step is hard, but you take the step. If you know it's hard and you embrace that it's going to be hard, then you take the step and then it will carry you. So it's like just getting that <laughs> over the hurdle. But it, but you know, everybody has to come to that in their own time and in their own way too, right? Because there's a whole lot of things that are going on, and uh, and what you have in terms of availability of resources, of connections, of feeling that you have a space where you can even just do that for yourself. It is all sorts of stuff that goes into that too but that first step is is will lead to many more and before we wrap up um you're making me think of i i i just got out of the habit but i look forward to this week now that the dumpster fire that was in my way of the daily walk is over i can get back to my daily walk but um i was doing one two three walks a day you know depending on how much time i had sometimes i could do a five minute walk a couple times a day other times i would go on a 45 minute walk and like find myself in a neighborhood that i forgot i lived near um and i was listening to podcasts and one day i was coming back and i had to teach a class that night and it was a business class and the last thing i wanted to think about was business by that point in the day and i was coming back and um and one of the things that I heard on this podcast that I was listening to was uh, somebody said, why is the grass always greener over there? Why do we have that thing where we say the grass is greener on the other side? And they said, well, your grass would be just as green if you weren't so busy watching their lawn and you were tending to your own. And I was like, that is why I'm on this walk. That is literally why I'm on this walk because I am tending to myself right now. And by tending to myself, now I can go teach that class. And I started the class with, Let's talk about why you're here, right? You're here because you want to build on something. You're here because you want to grow. And um, in 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 offering these workshops that Eileen and I, you know, were first imagining, um, we were talking with each of you about the desire to get to people of every body type, of every ability, to make something that was accessible. And the fact that when people are in their homes. They don't have to succeed to the level at which the class is happening, but that they can do what their body allows. And I wonder if any of you have had any um, accessibility observations that have happened. And by accessibility, I mean physical limitations as opposed to, um, you know, financial accessibility. Have, have any of you seen anything or heard of any interesting breakthroughs during this time? Because I think that is another thing that we're trying to get to, right? Like, how do we keep moving when that, sometimes our bodies don't allow us to. Has anybody had a? Um, well, I've been running this, uh, like a gym class, like a uh, workout. Um, for uh, some of the, the senior group. And I'm running two classes right now. And the first class is a limited mobility class. And I have just gone through transferring everything to a chair. And what's been so amazing is like figuring out for myself, how do I transfer this? How do I stretch this part of the body when it, it may not move that way? Um, and what it has done actually is open my eyes to more possibilities mm. as opposed to them being limitations is actually whole worlds of movements that are that are there and because you know we we get into our own routines we individually get into our we get in groups of people we get into our own sort of thing we just forget that sometimes we just need to knock on the door of oh right uh, this whole thing could transfer to this environment or this, these circumstances or this capacity or this, oh, that's so interesting. So in doing that, it has actually really opened up a whole other way that I'm thinking about how I'm teaching fuller mobility classes because there are things that I'm actually able to do in the limited mobility classes that I'm like, oh, I should probably actually focus a little bit on that and the other ones too. So like, 
not bypassing or shortcutting or, you know, getting to something quick. You, it's like there's actually a really an, an amazing work that can happen. And so in terms of mobility, especially working with uh, seniors groups, um, is that you realize that there's a, a huge capacity for movement in, in limited circumstances or environments. And uh, to be able to see their joy, like, to, like the, that class is so special because they, they are like the, 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 all those endorphins are going, all that stress release is going. They're just, and we're all dancing and moving together. And there are times when some of them have said to me, it's like, I just, I did, had sort of just didn't think that I could, you know, and then here they are. And then we're doing a whole little thing. And Gabby's come in to teach this class. And oh my gosh, like they, they just eat it up. They eat it up. And their joy is like beaming off their faces. So just the fact that we can work in those capacities, it's like I've had a whole new learning curve and it's just opened my eyes to a whole bunch of other things too. So it's been really great. Well, we, we want to respect everybody's um, time. And I think that that is a really wonderful place to wrap up um, and to thank you all for uh, seeing the limitations of this time and looking for the possibilities within it and creating space and holding space for each of us because it has really been expansive. Um, for everybody who's partaken and as Eileen is doing right now we literally every week end with like oh yes needed that um so thank you for bringing your gifts and um we look forward to the next one and uh I hope that everybody joins us on Wednesday for Alexis's dance class uh, which will be super fun um but thank you all and uh I wish you all a wonderful evening Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you so you. much, ladies. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Nice to thank chat you. with everyone. Thank Good you night. so much. Good night. Good night.